Well, I think some of the most powerful testimonies of God's power and grace and mercy are stories of forgiveness. I remember a few years ago, I was watching a, episode, or a, a news story on TV, and the video cut into an apartment in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where a woman was ironing clothes and singing praises to the Lord. And the reporter's voice came over in kind of a snarky overtone. Mary Johnson sings praise to the Lord for no apparent reason. After all, if anyone has the right to be angry at God, it's Mary. <laughs> You see, in 1993, Mary's 21-year-old son, an only child, was brutally killed um, at a party by a 16-year-old neighbor kid by the name of O'Shea Israel. And at the time, Mary was furious, she was hateful, she was bitter towards O'Shea for what he had done. And she, she even said that he was a wild animal and deserved to be caged. But after um, he had spent several years in prison, something really remarkable happened in that she realized because of her faith in Christ, she was called to forgive him. And so she did that. She went to the prison and she forgave the murderer of her son, which brings us to the question of the soul we're going to be focusing on these next few minutes, which is how many times am I to forgive? And we see this question posed and answered quite clearly in the gospel of Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 22. And the disciple Peter, he comes to Jesus and he asks, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Now, before we dive farther into that, I think it's uh, important that we get something on the table. That forgiveness is really hard. At least it is for me. I don't know about you. But I have no problem asking for forgiveness, pleading for forgiveness, begging for forgiveness. But when it comes time for me to extend that same mercy and grace and love towards others, I have a really difficult time sometimes. I think C.S. Lewis said it well in Mere Christianity that everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they actually have something to forgive. Amen? Yet the idea of forgiveness is so central to our lives as Christians and imitators of Christ. First off, I think it's so important and essential that we remember and understand that we are products of forgiveness ourselves, redeemed from sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that and flowing out of that is, the ability, is that the ability to forgive well is imperative to our life as Christians and as imitators of Christ. What we must never forget, and this is the most important point of this whole message, is that forgiveness naturally flows out of a genuine understanding that we are living forgiven lives because of the blood of Christ. And if we claim to be reconciled with God through the death and resurrection of Christ, we are called to live with continual attitudes of forgiveness. I think forgiveness and and the ability to forgive and the call to forgive is something really unique to us as the Christian community and something that has the opportunity to set us apart from the rest of the world. I remember a few weeks ago around finals time when I shouldn't, shouldn't have been, I was watching TV. And my wife and I, as seminary students, don't have a ton of money to spend on extra things. So we don't have cable. We just have the best 12 channels that Kentucky television has to offer. <laughs> and, and it was the middle of the day. And so that's like soap opera time and daytime talk shows. And so the best thing I could find on television was Katie Couric's show, Katie, Talk That Matters. So talk That Matters sounds good. And so I watched it and I was instantly captivated because she said this. She said, coming up next... If you're a fan of revenge, you're not going to want to miss this segment. And basically the whole segment, well, first off, being a fan of revenge, I put the remote down on the table and sat through the commercials to wait and see what was up, right? (laughs) And so it comes up and it was all about women getting revenge on previous boyfriends. And it was, I mean, it was nasty and they were getting their revenge. And I was kind of captivated. And then I realized and it dawned on me how, how messed up our world is right? Our world is fans of revenge. We cheer for revenge. We're entertained by revenge. Yet the Bible, Scripture, Christ calls us to live with absolute lives and attitudes of forgiveness. We live in a very, very broken world. But when we live in a broken world, the most important thing is that we go to Scripture. We root ourselves in the Word of God. And so going back to these verses, 21 through 22 in chapter 18, they fall in the context of two different passages dealing with this subject of forgiveness. First off, starting in verse uh, 15, Jesus gives this discourse on dealing with sin in the church. And most of us are probably pretty familiar with it, but just to kind of go through and paraphrase it, 
First off, starting in verse 15, he says, If a brother has sinned against you, go and show him his fault. And if, you, and if you've been successful, that's great. You have won your brother over. But if not, in verse 16, he says, bring two or three Christian witnesses. Now, if that's worked, again, you've been successful. You've won over your brother or your sister. But if it hasn't been successful, take them before the church. And if that works, then great. You've won over your brother or sister. But if it hasn't, Christ says to treat them, as, and this is kind of shocking coming from the mouth of Jesus, but he says, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. A pagan or a tax collector. Essentially, excommunicate them from the church. So here we see in verse 21, Peter comes to Jesus with a natural question, and probably something that was on the minds of all the disciples at this time. He says, Jesus how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, I can put myself in Peter's shoes, right? Sometimes, as Christians, at least myself, I'm tired of turning the other cheek and sometimes feeling like I can't stand up for myself. Sometimes I just want to put somebody in their place. And I imagine that's kind of what Peter was starting to get at here. Now, we read Peter's suggestion of, should I you know, ask, forgive them seven times? And we kind of chuckle at first. But we read in the Old Testament that the rabbis at the time um, strongly suggested that you could forgive someone three times. And if by the third time they had not um, accepted the forgiveness or recognized their sin, you were free to retaliate. So here, Peter is actually being pretty admirable. He's doubling that number, adding one and thinking to himself, okay, this is going to be a good answer. Jesus is going to like this. Wrong. Jesus comes back and he says, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Now, while my version says 77 times, the more accurate translation is probably 70 times 7. Now, I'm no math major, but I think 70 times 7 is 490. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. But, and so now the, now the question becomes, do we forgive 490 times? No. At least I hope not, because I'm sure that by the end of my life, if not already, I've asked for forgiveness 490 times. Instead, this was more of a Jewish saying, for don't hold grudges. Do not hold grudges. In other words, if you're going to actually take the 490 times literally, by the time you've forgiven someone that many times, you have become disciplined and living out an active and continual life of forgiveness. Here, Jesus does away with the idea of revenge completely, and he establishes a radical a radical, not a, a simple, but a radical precedent of living with a continual attitude of forgiveness. So we read this, and it's coming off the, wheels of, off the heels of this uh, discourse on sin in the church. And we read verse 17, which talks about treating them as a pagan or a tax collector. And the question becomes, well, don't these kind of contradict each other? I don't think they do. I'm not sure of the, the correct answer, but I think there's a healthy tension there. And we have to recognize the fact that we are just simply called to forgive. And we are called to forgive in recognition of the fact that God is the ultimate and final authority issuing judgment in light of individual repentance. Now, another issue with forgiveness is that some people think that by forgiving others, we are somehow condoning sin or saying it was okay or excusing it. And I really enjoy the words of the scholar N.T. Wright on this and he says this forgiveness doesn't mean i didn't really mind or it didn't really matter i did mind and it did matter otherwise there wouldn't be anything to forgive merely something to adjust my attitudes about forgiveness presupposes that the thing which happened was indeed evil and it cannot simply be set aside as irrelevant along that route lies suppressed anger and steady distancing of people who no longer trust one another he says this, a much better plan is to put things out on the table and deal with them. You see, as Christians, when we forgive, we are not condoning sin. We're not excusing sin. But what we are doing is dealing with our troubles, putting them on the table, dealing with conflict before others as to not ruin our witness as Christians. Something did happen, and it did matter. Otherwise, we wouldn't even be talking about forgiveness. I also enjoy that he said at the end of that quote, along that route lies suppressed anger and a steady distancing of people who no longer trust one another. 
I think this indicates the importance of forgiveness, not only for the receiver of the forgiveness, but the giver of the, of the forgiveness. I love the words of Nelson Mandela as he reflected on leaving prison after his incarceration. He said, as I walked down that door towards the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew that if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. Indeed, I think the inability to forgive often leads to the creation of our own prison of, of bitterness and of hatred and of holding grudges towards one another. So going back to the scripture, after Peter's question to Jesus and, and the, the surprising response of Jesus, Jesus continues on with a parable of what we call the unmerciful servant. And just to paraphrase, a king decides to forgive his debtors. And the scripture tells us, Jesus tells us that one of the debtors owed a debt that was 10,000 talents. Now we know from study of the time and money of the time that this 10,000 talents probably equated to millions and millions and millions of dollars today. Basically indicating a, a ridiculous um, amount of debt and probably um, unlikely that a king would actually let someone get into that much debt which shows the sheer magnitude of the forgiveness that was about to happen. You see, originally the king wanted his money back, but eventually the debtor was able to convince him to wipe his slate completely clean. Yet most of us know what happens next. The debtor turns around to someone else who owes him a very small amount, and he's, he's angry and bitter, and he demands repayment. Yet when the person's not able to repay the debt, he has him thrown in debtor's prison. Now, people who know about this guy and how much debt he was forgiven of are angry, so they go to the king. The king, being pretty furious about what happened, has this guy thrown in debt, thrown in debtor's prison for his enormous astronomical debt that we all know he would not be able to repay on his own. Sound familiar? In the same way, we are to forgive because the king forgave us. He wiped uh, our slate clean of the enormous debt that we were unable to pay on our own. And as a result, we are to show mercy to others, forgiving those who have sinned against us. A debt that's impossible to repay on our own. So going back to the story of Mary Johnson and O'Shea Israel, at the time of this um, new story, the video cut kind of pulls out and Mary is standing in her apartment building in unit 904 and O'Shea is in unit 902. You see he got released from prison early and they had built a, a real relationship dwelling in forgiveness and O'Shea ended up living in the apartment next to her thanks to her putting in a good word to the landlord. At the time of the video he travels to prison singing and teaching about the God of second chances oftentimes with Mary there as his number one cheerleader. He admits that he's learning, still learning to forgive himself, but through Christ acting through Mary, he is learning that in Christ alone can our sins be truly forgiven. You see, not only does Jesus call us to extend forgiveness, but he gives us the power to show forgiveness. We are to forgive because it breaks us from the personal bondage of anger and bitterness. We are to forgive because Christ lived a life of forgiveness, teaching us to love our enemies and forgive our debtors. As imitators of Christ, we are to live with continual attitudes of forgiveness. The question, how often are we to forgive? Christ has given us the answer. The question now is, are we willing to follow his example? Amen.